So now we are here and we will go in a moment into motivation. But first, let's give you, let's start with an overview. What, uh, how this lesson will go, we will spend 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes talking about why do we do this even and what what is it? What is automated testing without without getting too technical and too detailed? This will be a nice, short, sweet overview. We plan two exercise sessions. So the first exercise session will be in roughly 15 minutes. And we decided to change the plan a little bit for we think it will be a better learning experience for everybody if the exercise will be about local testing. We will try PyTest locally. We understand that this is interesting for those who develop Python. Those who don't develop Python, please try it out. We decided to demonstrate the automated testing as a demo, a simpler version of it. So this is something that Thomas and me will show you. We think that this will be a better experience for you. And then we will take a break. And then after the break, we will do another exercise session. And there we will focus on test design. And we will tell you how that works in a little bit later. Good. Now, uh, before we go into motivation, what is the big picture here? The big picture is, the, is this one. And maybe you identify with this, is that you develop your project and you change some part of it, you know, part B or C, and suddenly a different part of the code over there suddenly doesn't work anymore. And then we have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what, what had changed. And we will see that testing is an answer to this. Oh, the other problem that you might identify with is that you get somebody else's code but it's really a scary thing to touch it and change it because you are not really sure if I change this thing over here, what are all the things that will now be different and break? And then plot twist, ah, it's your own code. So this can even be your own code in uh, that you- From looked, two years back. From two years back and you don't remember anymore. And then again, time wasting. Uh, let's talk about motivation. Why do we do this? Well, we hinted on, on, on it already. And what, what is testing? And we like to compare untested software, like when we do experimental research on detectors. If before we do, before we use instruments and detectors and spectrometers and satellites oh, the first step is often calibrating it and this is what we want to do here we want to have a way that we can calibrate our code every time i change it i can write my i can run this calibration script and i know that what i expected it to do it still continues doing how does testing look in practice um, here we have some examples. Um, so testing in practice means that we not only write code, and here is a code that computes, it converts temperature in Fahrenheit to Celsius. It's a relatively simple code written in different languages. So here you can choose your favorite one. And if, if your favorite language is missing, please send us a pull request. So this is how it looks in R. It's a relatively simple function, and we can imagine that this could be a more complicated function, but we didn't want to show you a complicated function. And automated testing or testing in, means that we not only write code, we also write code that tests other code. Here I have a test function test Fahrenheit to Celsius, and it will, it will call this Fahrenheit to Celsius function with, with a certain temperature, and it will verify whether what, it, what comes out of that function matches the expected result. 
to a certain numerical accuracy. And why, why we need to maybe sometimes worry about numerical accuracy, we can talk about later. We also have an exercise on this. And then we need a way to automatically, every time I change the code, I want it should run this thing automatically. In the, in the case of Python and PyTest, it will go through all my code and find all the functions that start with test underscore and it will run them. And if the result doesn't match the expected result, it should complain to me. And that's really automated testing in a nutshell. And if Python looks unfamiliar, then, then look at your favorite language, how it could look there. And essentially every language has some kind of testing environments that can mm. that you can use to um to to indicate what functions are test functions and what functions to run mm -hmm. and as we go here and as we talk about motivation and the tools please contribute here with questions and comments the more questions on the collaborative notes the better it will be for all of us it will be really also easier for the instructors Keep them coming. Thanks for the feedback about also readability. So that's what it's all about. Now, why do we teach testing? Why do we use testing in practice? Sometimes here are a couple of reasons. First of all, we want to make sure that as we change the code, the thing is still doing, it's still working. Or at so least preserving I, what was ha what was happening before, so yes. you keep backwards compatibility. Yeah. If if your code is used by other people, it will it might help them because then when they install it, they can run the tests and verify that it produces the same expected results on their computer as on on my computer. It can also help other developers. It can help the next student, the next master students, the next postdoc comes in if they were they will be less afraid to make changes if they have a test set that tells them that well everything we expected to work is still working and it also as i said earlier it gives you an example of how certain functions are being used if yeah. documentation is lacking yeah that's a great point because often when i go into a project that i don't know and imagine that there is no documentation or the documentation is outdated then i look at the tests because the test to see how, how something is being used yeah yes how to use it Same sometimes here. i don't see it from the function here this is a relatively nice function but sometimes i don't see it i don't understand it but then i look at the test uh, okay so this is what how they expected to use it so it can be a nice documentation for new people joining it can also help managing complexity or uh, if it is if a code is easy to test it's also probably easy to maintain and we will we will get a feeling for this when we talk about test design. And if I turn it around, it means that uh, if I add tests to the code, it will be actually more difficult for me to make it very complicated. And we will return to this in the later session today when we talk about module code development. But now discussion to all of us and let me copy that into the document. So is it okay to not add tests? And, and I can already spoil this that yes, it is okay to not everything has to have automated tests, but we would love to hear from you. I will copy it in here. Uh, how should we do it? So this is a question. Well, let me share what I'm actually doing. So I'm pasting this, this question into the notes. Mm. And here it would be nice to hear from you all what you think. Uh, the first thing actually isn't a question, but an example. Mm -hmm. So should people vote, vote there? I don't know. How should we use this? You help mm. me. Oh, well, will... may, may, maybe have the... Well. I also want to add the other question already, which is what yeah, is easy and how to test? Mm. 
Mm. And how about you, Thomas? So what is, how would you uh, okay. comment on this? When is it okay not to add tests? Um, I would say during development, uh, you can write a couple of functions and not write individual tests for them. Um, if you have something that, yeah, this this obviously correct um, things where where for for example the Fahrenheit uh conversion is something that where mm, you 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 can discuss whether this actually needs a test uh in a, in a larger framework I would say yes in a large framework it definitely makes sense to have an individual test for it um but if it's a uh, if it's something smaller for your code where you just yeah you use this a few times could be okay or going without the test. Um, the, the biggest problem for the what's easy and hard to test thing for me is always uh, if it's a really, if it's some, some really complex code, then writing tests gets um, difficult. If things depend on each other and you are, and you can't just rely on um, individual pieces being tested, but need to check whether the whole thing actually produces something that you um, mm -hmm. that you expect. Uh, for example, I, I yeah, I, I'll give that, or I'll show a bit of this uh, later on as well. Um, I've written a backend server and testing whether that server, when ha when getting set up in a certain way, gives expected results is something that uh, becomes quite complex to test in the end. Um, yeah. And I'm not, I, in, in that instance, uh, for example, I'm actually not testing, uh, I'm not, not, doing a, not doing a huge amount of unit testing, but um, I'm testing larger fractions or larger parts of the code, um, which essentially leads to all individual parts being tested that they cooperate well mm. or cooperate correctly and lead to a similar a similar result um yes it's better to have all individual parts tested as well but mm -hmm. sometimes you don't uh, some, sometimes you don't really want to write tests for every single bit if you are testing them again in a larger framework anyways I also wanted to comment on this one here. Uh, sometimes you you know you have a notebook or something, and at the end there is an image coming out, and you can see that it is whether it's correct or not. However, it can still be nice if you then in the README describe what are the things that you look at, because it may be very obvious to the person who created it, but much less obvious to see whether it's correct or not to the to the other person who will use it. And that can be even a starting point at some point to create an end-to-end -end test, if you in words describe, like how would you describe it on the telephone, um, via telephone on how to check whether this is working correctly. And that can be a starting point for an automated test. More about that later. I would now a few more minutes on some terminology. So you may, you might hear about unit tests and that's, some, that's a test that tests a function typically. Yep. The tests that we have seen above, those are yep. unit tests. And then there are end-to-end -end tests. And end-to-end -end means you test the whole program. You send data in, it runs through the whole program, it produces some data, either some numbers or some image, and then you verify, is the result what I expected? And that would be, if if I have a code that is comp it's growing and it's getting complicated and I don't have any tests yet, this is what I would start with. I would start with adding an end-to-end -end test. And later, maybe I would maybe add a couple of unit tests. That's how I would start. Some people start even writing tests before they even write the code. That can be an interesting approach because then you describe how you want it to behave and then you write your code until the test passes. Yeah. I mean, they, they, as I mentioned earlier, they, this is something that for larger, uh, larger teams coding, this is a sensible approach because you anyways have to define your code structure, your 
how your different parts are interacting. And then you mm -hmm. can write tests for, okay, if I put this in, I expect this to come out. And yeah, then, then start writing the code so that th these tests work. Yeah. I would say that we should maybe try to experience it. And then uh, later people can return to these mm -hmm. terms because we will see some of them in yep. really in real life and in practice. And now I would like to conclude the motivation session where to start um, because you will hear a couple of approaches so where to even start if it's a simple script something that fits into one laptop screen or um, it's a notebook probably you don't need an automated test if you have nothing yet I would start with an end-to-end -end test we will show you how the way I like to approach it is I describe in words how would I check it if it still works and then translate translate the words into a script any language and then find a way to run this automatically every time you change the code and if you want to start with unit testing and you want to add tests for functions then maybe start with the function that you are about to rewrite there is this one function that you want to optimize start there you add a unit test there, then rewrite a the function, then you already have a safeguard. And later you can add more unit tests. Let's, should we look at an example? And yeah. we will let you explore that in an exercise session in a moment, but I wanted to tell you what you can do there. So in the exercise session, oh, let me check the time. We will give you a little bit more than 15 minutes. You can try this out on, on a relatively simple Python project. Oh, you will create a new directory, step into it. It's a relatively simple Python code that adds two things together. And there is a test for it. And your goal will be to to run this test function locally on your computer using a tool called PyTest. And then what you can try is you can try how does it look if I break the code. So then you will break the code, run it again, and it should start complaining. And this will be the goal. The goal. So the goal for the exercise will be to practice locally here until 40 minutes past the hour. I will just just as a it. reminder, this needs to be run in the code refinery environment. Yes, so the code it will depend on PyTest, but PyTest is then inside your Conda environment. Yeah. Uh, exercise until forty, and what the goal is? It's this one here. And questions, please keep them coming. This is great during the exercise, before the exercise, after the exercise, and we will continue answering them. And then we will see you again 40 minutes past the hour with more questions. And then we will hear with Thomas look at how can we do this testing on services like GitHub. Everything good, everything clear. Then see you at 40 minutes past the hour. See you then, good luck and bye. And welcome back and we are back from the exercise we have 20 minutes left before a break hopefully the exercise went okay we got some interesting questions in the document which we also try to answer please have a look what we will now do in the, in the 20 minutes before the break is that you have now maybe seen that yes we can run tests locally on my computer 
but is there a way to run them automatically? Every time there is a new commit or every time there is a new pull request. And yes, there is a way. We can do that on GitHub, you can do it on GitLab, you can do it on your own server, and we want to show you a few examples. We will do this as a demonstration and we will keep it simpler. We will simplify a little bit. We will not go through this page in detail. But the good news is that on this page, you can then find really detailed step by step. So later, if you're interested in how was this really done in Python, in R, how does it really work on GitHub, GitLab, here you can find it. I want to now set up a simple example on GitHub and Thomas will help me. I will open up my GitHub. And you can, if you want, you can now try to do the same thing. I think the best way to participate is watch us do it and give us comments, ask us questions. And then later you can retrace it step by step following the instructions. So what I will do is I will create a new repository on GitHub and I will try to do everything here on GitHub. I will not even use my command line. Let's make a new repository. We have done it a few times in the workshop. Uh, example, test example, testing example. Let's give it somehow a good name. Just a demo. It will be public. Anybody can follow. I will create a readme file so that I have something to start with. And if you want to find it again, follow along, I will also place it on the document. So here is my example repository. It's out there. And now I want to add, a, mm -hmm, I want to add a simple Python code that I want to test. I will keep it very, very, very simple. Let's create a file. And it will be called example.py. And it can do, whoops. The code can do very simple things. It can add, it can subtract, it can multiply. Let's not look too closely. There might be a mistake, but I want to keep the mistake in there. So this is my example code and let's commit, commit the changes, add a new Python file, commit. I have a new file, I have a new commit. How do I test it now automatically? There is this nice thing called actions. So on GitHub, it's called GitHub actions on GitLab. This is called GitLab CI, as in continuous, continuous integration. And I think continuous integration, I look at it as a different word for automated testing. So now I can go in here. And now there is a, it suggests me that I can use many um, so-called workflows as a starting point. And I know that this is now a Python project. If this was an R project or a C++ project, you could look for other starting points. But I want to look at Python. Let's, let's search for Python, what is out there. You see there is a lot out there. I think I want to start with <clears> this you one. You want the Python application, yes. And it will do a little bit more than we want, but it will be a good starting point. But you can see that there is a lot more. So if you want something for automated packaging, there is a starting point. I will start with this configure. Oh, no. How can I close this now? Oof, I don't want to see this. I don't know. What if I zoom out? Okay, now it's gone. It's, there is some commands. It, this workflow has a name. Later, we want it to run every time I push to the main branch or every time I get a pull request. 
and you see that you can configure this. It will run on Linux, but you can also define workflows that run on macOS or Windows. This test will run on Python 3.10, but you can also define tests that run on a series of Python versions if you want to test across a, a number of versions. Here is something interesting. Here we are de installing dependencies. Now I will simplify it a bit. We don't, oops. At, at the moment, we don't need this. We don't have a requirements text file. We don't need flake eight. We don't need to know what it is. All I need is PyTest. I don't need all of this. So this was just a good suggestion for later, but not at the moment, whoops. So now let me, let me browse this. I want to run on main branch with Python 3.10, it should install dependencies and then it should test my code, example.py. You don't need to remember all the steps that I did. What the learning outcome that we want you to know is that this exists. There is a whole marketplace of workflows and with you, you can then adapt it to your needs. And I will now commit it and see what happens. It may or may not work. Uh, add a workflow to automatically test. Commit. And now the workflow was added into a new di directory told, called .github slash workflows. If you were there yesterday for the documentation session, then you have seen this before. We have used this approach yesterday to automatically built a Sphinx project um, on GitHub. And this is a really similar thing, but in this case, we don't build documentation, we test the code. And now I can go to actions and I see that something didn't work, but maybe that's what we expected. Ha, huh, let's, let's see. So something failed and I can look at details and it, installed Python 3.10, it installed dependencies, it and failed it during anything. the test. Oh, sorry, what happened here? You don't have any tests. Oh, in your yeah, example of Py. Aha, excellent point. We, I never added a test. So let's add that one. And now the test could go into a separate file. I personally like to put them in the same file because I use tests as a documentation. Let me edit and I will add a test for, well, for all of them. Test in PyTest, they start with test underscore. So make sure assert that, I don't know, two, two and three should give five. And I add another test for subtract make sure that subtract two minus three should give minus one. And let's another one, def test multiply. Oh, there are some mistakes here. Two times three is six. This is not a very extensive test, but it's already something then when I write code, I like to do this, but this is just really cosmetical. I like to have the test close to the function. It helps me understand it. So I would have written it like that. Good. Now let's see what happens. Commit changes. Now we, we added a few tests. Let's see, fingers crossed, commit changes. And the interesting part now, there is a new commit and now it automatically starts a new test. Now I don't have to do it on my computer. It installs Python, it installs PyTest, it runs PyTest on my file. What do we expect? We expect it to get a little bit further, but... At the moment it still will fail because one of the functions is Oh, it's already finished, but maybe now it failed for a different reason. 
so it ran a test and the output here looks very familiar if you have run PyTest locally previously. And it tells me now there is a test that failed and, and it's, it's the false. subtract one. And it also tells you what was wrong. Yes, As it that expected. five is not minus one. Yeah, it expected to see minus one, it got five. So it tells me that, well, something is really wrong in this function. And that's very helpful. And now, do we have time? Yes, we have time. I will try to fix it, but I will try to fix it not directly here on main branch. I will create a new branch and create a pull request because I wanted you to see that now this automated testing is part of a pull request and it's part of code review. And it will make it so much easier for also for the person reviewing the code because they can immediately see does this now break the tests or does it preserve the tests? Let me create a branch. How do the I create branches? Need, the mm -hmm. only thing they actually need to check is that the tests weren't altered. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's one reason why I like to not have the tests in the same file. Okay. Yeah. I think here for simplicity, I put it in the same yeah, file. Yeah, for simplicity, this is perfectly fine, but... That's good point how to create branches there are several ways you can do it here directly main uh, you can I can create a branch here there is also this thing called view all branches which currently is only one and here I can have a new branch new branch and it's called uh, fixing addition subtraction oh subtraction Thanks. Create a new branch. Oh, now I have a, um, I can go to a new branch. And here I am on the new branch, fixing subtraction. And here I can edit the file on my branch. Example, edit and what do I need to fix? Subtract. This Subtract was wrong. From plus to minus. And commit the change. This will fix my code. But I'm still on the branch. Now, if I go on actions, nothing happens. Why not? Because I defined the workflow to only run whenever I the main branch changes or there is a pull request. So what I'm missing here is a pull request. Let's create a pull request. This has re recent pushes, so let's create one. Pull request from that branch to towards main branch. Here I can add more context. If there was an issue, I could reference it. Here we can reference. Also issues, we have learned that last week. Uh, what do we change? This thing looks good, C let's create it. And once I create a pull request, once I open it, now it should start doing something. Aha, you see, now it's starting to run some checks and now they are part of the pull request, they are part of the code review. Let's wait a few seconds. If I want to see details, I can. So clicking here, I can then go through the steps and see that everything's working well, but everything will work well. Now, all the checks finished and it's a, every, the test is now passing. And now we can imagine that, uh, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm not the same person, I'm not reviewing my own code, but I will now not switch to Thomas just to save time. So let's imagine that I'm I'm a different person now reviewing, very happy. This is the change. It restored the test set. Happy times, let's merge. Delete. And now it will actually run the test again because the main got modified. And then the next thing you might want to do is to add a a little badge here to your readme file, which will link to the test status. And then everybody can see is the test passing or not. And now it's part of the code review. Wonderful. 
what else can we do, Thomas? Do you have an example of other things we wanted to show in the remaining four minutes, five minutes before we go into a break? Yeah. Yes, um, there, there are, well, one thing that is really nice to do um, is uh, so-called coverage reports. Um, uh, okay, I think that right again. So, uh, um, I'm just showing this here on a uh, actually a Java repository. Um, so, if when this when code tests happen, um, almost all testing uh, environments do have something that's called uh, that that can produce code coverage. That means it shows you what parts of your code are actually being tested in uh, during your during your tests. And most um, most larger projects do show that, and it is a nice way to see whether your tests actually cover what you have coded, or whether they miss most of the code that you have that you actually have in your repository. Um, this is a yeah, this is a backend server for for something I'm coding. Um, I'm currently at seven seventy seven percent. I'm quite happy with that. Um, even though it's not 100%, but you rarely will have really 100% coverage for more complex things, especially if uh, your code does uh, does contain um, error handling or similar things where you don't where you don't necessarily test every single um, unexpected state, especially states that you simply can't test because mm -hmm. they are handling things like underlying databases not working for whatever reason or uh, these kind of things they just can't be tested you have the you have handling in in the code but they can't reasonably be tested or not easily be tested so um code um i'm using here a coverage report um built with codecuff codecuff is um uh, is a web service that uh, allows you to upload upload coverage reports and display all the things quite nicely. Um, due to this being Java, uh, I'm not going to go through the whole folder structure here, um, but essentially what this code cap then gives you is an overview, okay, um, this is how your um, how your coverage looks like. And if you go into an individual file, it shows you, okay, well, this is import statements that don't get run anyways. Um, the green things are things that are being run. Red is what's not. So this is the thing. Um, if some, In this case, these three lines are logging for errors that I, ca I can't easily reproduce, so I'm not testing for this failing. Um, are you using this uh, coverage also to find code that nobody ever uses uh, and maybe it can be removed because it has been kind of forgotten and edited. Um, partially, yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if, if you have code that is, um, yeah, that is simply not being, um, not there and not being used at all, you, you can also see, okay, well, this stuff that I can remove. Sometimes it's not, uh, in the in this case, I'm not removing uh, some things because I'm not entirely sure whether that might be used in production uh, in that uh, class um, at some point. Uh, but it's but it's really difficult to test. Um, so I have some stuff here that is badly tested, which is partially um, a copy of some uh, some code from the underlying net, underlying server that or underlying tech that I'm using. And mm -hmm. um, that's why this is so so badly covered. Mm -hmm. I am trying to get the coverage as high as possible, but there is always stuff where yeah, it just uh, just can't. Yeah. And what it also shows you, what's quite nice, um, the percentages look nice, but it also shows you how many lines were actually missed. So mm -hmm. this is probably more where you would look. Okay, can I improve my um my coverage for that part? So to actually cover those missing lines as well. Yeah. So this is a really nice tool. I think we have now really one minute left. So let's summarize what we, I mean, if I forgot to say something, please add, but it's a nice tool. It's, it can be a nice additional tool that can give you more information about which part of the code is tested and even used. I think it's a good tool for projects that are larger than few small files yeah. where you can lose overview.
And um, if you are curious about how that works, yeah, Thomas has the screen share. Uh, ju just um, we are giving some examples for um, coverage uh, generation for uh, for GitHub with Python, for GitHub with R, for GitLab with Python. Um, those coverage uh, the coverage things that we uh, that are set up in these examples are not uh, cover are not uh, code cuff because they are kept simple. Because for code cuff you need even more setup, 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 but they do produce the coverage within the uh, within the within GitHub itself. So you can still check how your coverage looks. You don't have that nice of an interface um, where and what, uh, but there are plenty of tutorials as well for setting up a code cuff coverage for different projects. Yeah. So we wanted you to know that these things exist. It can take half a day a day to set this up for your project, but after you have set it up, then it's running automatically for you every time somebody changes the code. It can be useful. I recommend that we go for a break. We will be back 13 minutes past, past the hour. And then we will talk about test design. There will be one more exercise session where you can think about test design and maybe discuss that test design if you are together with other people. So let's meet again 13 minutes past. Thanks for listening. See you later. See you after the break. Bye. And we are back live after the break. Interesting stuff coming up. But before we go to more interesting stuff, please ask us, ask us more questions. Questions about the concepts, questions about automated testing, how to set it up um, before we, or also during, uh, during the next episode. So what we want to do now in the remaining part is to discuss test design. How does it really look in practice? How do we approach it in practice? Because we have seen, we have heard about concepts and we have seen a very simple example, addition, subtraction, but in reality, the examples are more complicated. So how do they look? How do we approach it? That's the next episode, test design. I will put it in the notes. Test design. Here we go. Here you can find our notes. Our plan here will be that we give, we will give you a tour of what you can find on this page. There is a lot. There is a lot more than we can do in during the exercise session. But the nice thing is that you can then choose your own adventure. So the questions we try to address is the different functions in different languages and different classes when you write object-oriented code, how can we test these in practice? How can we how can we test an entire program? We talked about this end-to-end -end test. How does how can it look? Um, some of you work with codes that involve random numbers. Uh, how can we do how can we test those? How can we test randomness? So some notes for the instructor. We will first give you a quick tour of what is in the, on this page. Then we will give you 20 to 30 minutes. We will see how it goes, uh, time. And then you, then you can choose your own adventure. You can choose also in different programming languages. So we have examples in, in a couple of languages. It would be nice to have more. It would be nice to have a MATLAB example here. You can also contribute examples. Also for each of these languages, if you are interested, we link to a quick reference where you can read more. Let's see how that looks. If I go here, quick reference for R, where do I land? Then you land on this quick reference page. And for here, we list the tools that we know about. This is not a complete list, but for instance, for R, we know that people like to use test that. And then here we have some starting notes and hints on how to try it out. And for all the other languages, we provide something similar. So PyTest, we have examples for 
let's see, scrolling down here. For Julia, Catch2, which is very popular in the C++ community, Google test as well. PF unit, which is popular in the Fortran community, etc. So going back to test design, and here then you can select, you can either look at functions, and here we have functions of increasing difficulty to write tests for. Classic example, factorials. For many or most, we also have a solution. But the goal here is not even to write code, and it's not even to write a test code and to, to implement automated testing. In my opinion, a good way to, to go through this exercise is to think about it. Um, express in words how you would approach it. How would you explain to somebody on the telephone how to test such a function? Then if you have time left, you can then try to express it in your, in your favorite language and then here you can also find a solution to this. Uh, we have functions that do text manipulation, that count how many times something appears in a, in a text. Uh, also here, we also have examples for when you have an external dependency. And with this, we introduce a concept of what is a pure functions and impure functions. And a pure function is a function that doesn't have any side effects. It doesn't depend on anything outside. And you will, if you go through these exercises and think about it a little bit, you will see that the functions that don't have dependencies are easier to test. And we will use that later when we write modular code, because these are functions that are easy to copy paste into a different place, into a different project, because they will still work. We have an example for how to test an object, a class. Then if you want to dive a little bit into test-driven development, there is an example with a possible solution. If you work with random numbers, uh, we have some food for thought and, and examples. And also for designing an end-to-end -end test, we provide two examples. Again, here, I think the a great learning experience would be to try to think how to do it instead of really doing it. What did I forget to say? Mm -hmm. Any questions coming up? No. Not yet, but we, we can have a look at the things that people said are hard to test, for example, and yeah. how you can approach that. Um, what was and... that again? Let's scroll up and see. Uh, mm. I think that test. when when making new directories in your program, uh, um, was point it? was quite interesting uh, because it's. I think the the difficulty that people think about here is that you create folders within your current working directory. Mm -hmm. And then uh, potentially cleaning them up. So essentially the test having side effects. Mm -hmm. uh, side, side effects on other tests, which can be really problematic. Yeah. So, so they should be independent of each other. And here is a good yeah. keyword. So if I want to, if I need to create a directory, then in the test, we create temporary folders and they should be unique. And they sh and at the end of the test, when the test finishes, they should be cleaned up again. There should be nothing left. It's it's also um, this reminded me a bit of a problem that we had with uh, MATLAB at the time uh, mm -hmm. and global variables. We had a test suite for a larger uh, large toolbox, and um, we used global variables to set um, what solver for the problems we were we are we are using at the moment. And for some reason. Um, the tests worked on one mm -hmm. system and failed on a different system. Uh, and it was like, what, what, what's going wrong here? Until we noticed that the global variables in the uh, were not reset in the MATLAB um, mm -hmm. internal unit yeah. testing. Yes. Which so, was yeah. really painful to then essentially set up a, our own unit testing um, system to, yeah, set the environment again every Global time state. before we run a test. 
Exactly. And this is also a great comment. Uh, another difficulty that many face is what if the computation takes too long? How do you approach it? So I also have a recommendation there, but I wanted to also hear from... Um, okay, well, how I would approach this is trying to get a... a commonly, this is some model simulation. And mm -hmm. what I would try to do is get a toy model to run it. Uh, run with uh, or to run it exactly. uh, a toy model where where I know exactly okay given my given what I do this should these should be the results um, I can't do it on the huge model that takes half a day um, that this that 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 I can potentially do uh, once before I publish a new stable version. There I can run these long time te long term tests sometimes, yes. but for a general automated um, updates, I wouldn't do that. Um, I would take a I would sim try if it's possible to simplify mm -hmm. whatever I have yeah. um, by as much as possible and run that run my test with a yeah smaller example and uh, use that for testing. That's a great great recommendation. A small synthetic example. It doesn't have to be the real thing. The real thing, I could set up my automated testing to run the real thing, to test the real thing once a week or once a month. But then for my day-to-day -day work, it's nice to have this small example, which doesn't have to be realistic, but it still goes through all the code and checks that it's working. This is not only helps me when developing, it will also help again the next person because now we have to copy pasteable example, something that, that runs in seconds or minutes. This is great to think about. So how about we give you time to think about these? So this is really more of a thinking exercise than a writing exercise, but you can make it a programming exercise if you want to. How about we give you time to think about these and please come back with lots of questions and comments and recommendations. And I say we, uh, we give 20 um, minutes. I, 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 I want to give one more comment. Um, mm -hmm about this to, uh, takes too long. Um, there is a limit on GitHub Actions how long they can take. So yeah. uh, if I remember that right, it's about an hour. Yes. So yeah, if it if your test takes more than an hour, you're, you mm -hmm. can't do that with automated testing. You will have to do that on your local machine or um, or you have to set up your own, uh, your own runner for a GitHub Action. Yeah, so, so you can then thing. connect your own runner. So it, you can still make it automated, but then it needs then to be Then you need to provide the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Good point. So we want to give you 20 minutes to select your own adventure, think about these, ask us questions. We can then return here all at 45 past. And we will spend the last 15 minutes of this lesson in discussing what we find, find out. Does that sound good? Then, oh uh, no, that's the wrong exercise. Here we are, 45 past. And yeah. I will then also write here more goals. See you then. See keep you back keep at putting in questions on uh, how to do things. Yeah. That we are happy to answer them. And they might, uh, they would be very helpful for the discussion. Yes. I think this is a really, really important exercise. Okay. See you in 20 minutes. Bye. And we are back. Welcome back after the exercise. 15 minutes left before a longer break. Please let us know how the exercise went. Uh, we see that I can see that 50 people, 50 browsers are connected to the collaborative document. Probably the real number of people is higher. It would be good to hear for us how it went. Was it useful? Was it not useful? Did you try? I think no answer means not, didn't try. How did it go? We looked at the questions during during the exercise session. Please keep them coming. We have currently 17-ish questions. It would be cool if we manage before, in the next 15 minutes, let's try to double the number of questions. I think we all have questions about testing. And it can also be more like philosophical questions. It doesn't have to be a technical question. So what should we talk about? Um, one important thing to talk about is side effects. You have, if you went through the exercises, you have maybe seen that 
you have experience that functions with side effects are maybe more difficult to test than functions without side effects. Let me show you an example. And it's this function here, which it reads a text and a word, and then it returns a count. How often does the word appear in the text? This function doesn't have side effects because if I send in the same text and the same word, it will always return the same result. Testing it is relatively easy. The other nice property of this function is that if I copy paste it into my own project, it will still work. With the same text, the same word, it will still do the same thing. Here is this almost the same function, but it it uh, reads a file and then counts how often does the word appear there. And this there is more side effects in this function. How come? And this might not be immediately visible. But the thing is that even with the same file name and the same word, you might get different results because the file might change. Something else might be writing to the file or reading from the file, modifying it, deleting it. So there are more side effects. Mm. Oh, and this, if you try to think about how you would test it, this is a little bit more complicated. Also, just as a comment, uh, test, uh, if you are testing the previous function, you need to make sure that you're actually not reading from a file or reading the text from a file, because then you get the same side effect again. If you, if you take mm -hmm. your test, from a file, that file can change. Then you have exactly the same situation uh, as in the count words from file. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what does it mean now in practice for me? It means that also if I design my code, I will probably try to rather write this kind of function. At some point, I still need to write, read the file, but I will do it a little bit more outside. And, yeah. and then I will test the parts that are easy to test. So it can help you deciding like where in my code should I do the file reading and writing? Where should I read from the website or from the database? More on the outside of the code. Mm -hmm. How about external libraries? So if my code depends on uh, NumPy, Pandas, X-Array, uh, some R libraries. Uh, should I test them as well? How do well, you do it, Thomas? Do you trust them? My, my, my personal take is if it's a relatively popular library, I commonly don't uh, assume that it's working correctly. And if I find if I find a bug um, while coding, and I initially assume it's my fault. Um, and the same goes for testing. So I assume they are correct. I'm not explicitly testing them. If yeah. it would be something that um, I take from somewhere small library somewhere on github not maintained anymore really i would put i would potentially say okay well let, let's let's write a simple test uh so that i putting something in getting something out i get what i expect uh it to actually produce um but mm -hmm. yeah it it it, dep it depends on the code that i'm working with On the library. Oh uh, yeah, good point. And I fully agree. And I think I approach it the same way. Um, another discussion that we had here in the studio during the exercise session was: isn't testing also so it's adding more work? But but we believe that it outweighs. So there is a benefit to it. It also adds more code. So suddenly there is more code to maintain because I also need to maintain the tests. They are also code. Um, and how to find a good balance there. And I mean, we don't have an answer here for this. This is um, a question that we need to ask for every single project, but there is a balance there of more more time spent, more code written. Sometimes it can be maybe in my way. Yeah, For me, it's a bit the, if I expect to be working with the code um, 
several times or I want others to work with the code, uh, I'm a lot more likely to write tests for it because mm -hmm. then I want this to properly work and I want to be sure that it works and I want, if there are changes to come uh, coming in, I want this to still work. Mm -hmm. And now we have uh, eight minutes left. The, this will be really our summary Q and A. You can really influence this. Keep the keep the questions coming. For instance, question number nineteen: Is there a way to test multiple test files? Yes. So if this is a Python project, you can then test an entire directory or entire package, and then it will go through all the files and pick up all the functions and run them one by one. We, the examples are mainly for simpli for sake of simplicity. It's only one function mm -hmm. or one file normally. Mm -hmm. It's also possible to run tests in parallel. So if you have many, many tests and they all take time and they all need one processor and you have more many processes available, it's also possible to run them all at the same time if you are in the situation. Uh, yeah. But I want to say something there because um, that also depends a lot on what you're testing. For example, if you're uh, testing uh, my my web server example um, from earlier, for example, um, there um, I can't run them in parallel because I need to set up um, was also in the questions essentially a mock database. Mm -hmm. And if I run them in parallel, uh, the mock da the data in the da uh, database um, would be a mixture of different tests. Yeah, it depends on what you want to test. Yeah. So if you want to test, uh, I, I think ideally I would design my tests so that they are independent, that they can be run in parallel, but it can be more difficult or... Well, if, if, if you have to access a da uh, database where that has a certain port and so on, um, then it, be it starts getting more difficult. Mm -hmm. Should we look at our conclusions and recommendations episode here, just that to make sure that we didn't forget anything really important? Yeah, let's have a look. What are the basics? In each language, there is a test framework. Have a look at it. In our quick reference, we list the ones that we know about, learn the basics, and they will help you with running these test functions and reporting back to you. You can then couple them with with our GitHub Actions, if you want to. But start, keep it simple. Uh, we think that implementing, once you start adding tests, it's good to automate it. And this is not to save a few seconds of, of my typing time. It's mostly for the people who want to then contribute with pull requests, because then they have something to hold on to. I think uh, the going more in-depth Fourth point is something that I think is quite useful. When you discover and fix a bug, commit a test against this bug. So if, if you find, okay, there is a bug, um, mm -hmm. you commonly didn't test for that edge case. And then putting, in, putting it in, make sure that this is not happening again due to some changes in code. Yeah, at least it will not come again in the same form. Yeah. <laughs> And, and this, this can help me deciding if I'm now, maybe I'm curious now about unit testing, I want to add them. I will not go into my code and add a unit test to every single function, but but the function that recently broke, uh, the function that recently had a bug, that's a good one to to add a unit test. At least that, that thing will not come back. We will see that in a, in a little bit later today we, when we talk about modular code it can really help you to make things more modular, more independent, because these dependencies, if one thing, if everything depends on everything, it becomes hard to test. But we don't want everything to depend on everything. And how to get started, and we have emphasized a couple of times, it's also okay, there are many situations where we don't need tests or automated tests. We, we don't want to make everything perfect. It's not a good use of our time, but with with already some simple steps, some some tests for really the complicated functions, some automated testing can get us a really long way, can go a really long way. And here we summarize some of the starting points. 
I would start with the end-to-end -end test. And even before programming it, I would describe it in words. When, when you open up your notebook, when you look at the result, what are the things that you look at to know whether this is correct or not correct? And then express it in a script. Good. What did we forget? There is more that we chose not to do. We have quick reference. And then if you want to test out the, try out the automated testing, you can go into the episode and really go step by step. We, we really took a really simple example and only demonstrate it because we want to motivate you to do it. We, it was not our ambition to that we remember all the steps and all the clicks. Okay, now looking at collaborative notes. So please stay also for the second session of today. We will take a one hour break and we will be back later with modular code development where we want to combine testing and reproducibility, reusability. We want to discuss what that even means. And it will be an improv session. So there won't be, a, there will not be any group exercises in the second session, but you can really shape the session by giving us suggestions, asking us questions. And then Jano and me will try to improve a code project based on your suggestions. And hopefully at the end of the second session, we will have a nicely modular reusable usable code. So please come back in one hour, then also for an outro session, maybe there will be some music. Let's see. And I think that's all from me. How about you, Thomas? Any any words before we close for the the testing lesson? Not really, but if you come up with any questions, just write them in the document. We'll try to answer them even during the break. Yeah. So thanks a lot, Thomas, for the session. Thanks everybody in the studio, all the helpers on the document. See you again in one hour for module code development. Really looking forward to that. See you then. Have a nice break and bye. Bye.